or good morning here. It's about ready to go into the afternoon. So good morning, everybody. Uneducated economist here. Um, put a video out yesterday talking about the lumber prices. Just kind of wanted to briefly talk about that one. A lot of people kind of came back to me saying the lumber prices are dropping because of the builder sentiment, even though I had try to explain that that is not the case that's going on with lumber prices right now. Lumber prices are dropping and dropping dramatically because of the oversupply that had come from the mills overproducing. Now, there was an issue that had been taking place where they could not get this stuff away from the mill fast enough and they actually started going into curtailment. That material is now entering into the system and you're going to find that the idea of there being an oversupply of lumber is very much prevalent within the industry right now and that's the reason why you're seeing the dramatic drop. Now I'm sure a lot of it that does have to do with the builder sentiment and the idea that starting new homes right now or new construction is going to be a very difficult thing to, to accomplish as far as like trying to get buyers to be motivated to actually purchase these homes considering the interest rates are running up but that does not stop projects that are generally in motion like it does stop projects like from starting you know people are like well i'm going to back off on this whole idea but once the project has started it's it's going it's going to go through with it now you're going to find a lot of a lot of stories coming up of people who maybe in the middle of a project and their builder just goes bankrupt or something like that that kind of thing will happen and you're going to hear a lot of stories of that going into the future but for the most part once a project has started it goes through i mean they, they see it through through completion the motivation to starting new homes that is dropping dramatically now when it comes to the lumber prices the homes that have been set into motion they're going to go through so the, there's going to be the demand for lumber going into the future what we're experiencing right now is an oversupply of lumber the mills have been backed up with lumber for quite some time. They're going into curtailment right now. I mean, there is there is a lot of reports of mill curtailments happening. I wish I could find the articles within the news, like to be able to Google some articles so I can share them with you guys. But it's just the stuff that I'm hearing within the industry from the people that I talk with. And so we're going to see like right in the middle of summer where typically you would think that there would be a lot of demand for lumber due to, you know, this is the building season. You're actually going to find mills going into curtailment and a tightening up of inventory in the middle of summer. By the time we get out of summer going into winter, we're going to see the exact opposite. We are going to see the mills coming back into production again and higher prices in the futures market. And I know a lot of people are probably going to disagree with that, but that's okay. Um, it's what I see happening and, you know, it's just a matter of time. We'll, we'll prove it again. Um, you know, I mean, I've not trying to toot my own horn on it, but I've been calling the lumber industry quite well for many months. Now, I have been off on my timeline a couple of times as far as when I thought we were going to hit the peaks and when we were going to hit the bottoms. But, you know, they're only a few months off that I've that I've missed it on. So really, that's pretty good, in my opinion. So, yeah, right now we're going to see lumber prices dropping to really low prices. When you get under 500 per thousand or down into this 550 mark, Mills are gonna, that's not the profitable spot for these mills any longer. The input costs and everything that goes into producing lumber is just too expensive for them. At 550 per thousand, they're just not making enough money. So when they run that up to seven, eight, even a thousand per thousand again, that's when the mills start pumping out a lot of lumber. And then it's the oversupply, undersupply that just continues to happen. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing out there is that the Federal Reserve is driving up the mortgage rates. And I, I, I agree with that, with that statement, you know, just from the fact that the Federal Reserve is pushing their Fed funds level up and that starts causing interest rates on everything to start going up. But something that I found interesting is that the Federal Reserve made this announcement that they were going to start lifting the interest rates quite a while ago and they've moved them up. Like if you go and look at the chart that I leave down in the description to the Federal Reserve Fred chart, the you know, the education department, whatever they call that, the, the Fred charts that they have. I think it comes out of the St. Louis Fed. But if you go and you take a look at that stuff. Oh, man, there's people yelling at each other over here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm just making sure they're in a fight starting. Um, so when you look at that chart, you see like there's this huge rise to the Fed funds level. But when it came to mortgages, like immediately there was this huge spike. Like I remember looking at mortgages three months ago or so that were up to the 7%, like 7% 7, 7 on a on a 30-year loan. And it's really hovered between like the 6 and 7% since then, like for the last three months. 
even though there's this constant push coming from the Federal Reserve saying that they're going to be lifting interest rates and pushing interest rates ever increasingly higher. But that's not what's taken place inside of the mortgages, right? The mortgages have basically been flat for the last three months or so. I mean, they move up and down just a little bit, but boy, these people are about ready to fight over here. Sorry. I just, well, maybe not. Anyway, um, God, can you hear them fighting? Can you hear them yelling? Anyhow, crazy people. Um, so anyway, what I kind of figure is going on here is that the free market in itself, is really there's a demand for mortgages out there like you know it's hard to believe that you know anybody besides the federal reserve would be interested in buying any kind of these mortgage-backed securities and if you're not familiar with mortgage-backed securities when you take when you take out a mortgage it gets packaged up with a bunch of other mortgages into something called a mortgage-backed security that an investor can buy and that's what the federal reserve was buying all throughout the quantitative easing they were loading up their balance sheet with these things so they're sitting on a lot of them and when the idea of like unwinding the balance sheet was getting rid of these mortgage backed securities, when they start putting that information out there, people were like, of oh, this idea is like, oh man, they're just going to drive the mortgages way up because as they start to unload these things, the price of them falls and the yields begin to rise, just like any other bond or anything else out there. When you have the price falling, the yields go up. And so as they're trying to unwind their balance sheet or get rid of these mortgage backed securities, a lot of people, you know, within the within the industry, just believe that you know there's going to be this huge flood of mortgage-backed securities out there, dropping the price and raising the the yields on them, which is very true. But then you got to think there's buyers beyond just the Federal Reserve, and at what interest rate are they going to be, or price are they going to be interested in these mortgage-backed securities? And I think that's really where like the bigger question should be asked, not so much like if the Federal Reserve is going to lift interest rates, causing the mortgage backed securities to go up. But how much demand for mortgage backed securities is actually going to come from the free market, from the, you know, the pension funds, the retirement funds, the insurance companies, all the people who buy these mortgage backed securities. At what price will they be like, oh, yeah, I'm getting in. So the Fed can continue to lift their interest rates, but the free market, the, the people out there who are interested in these mortgages, they could very well keep the yields from rising any further as the demand for these mortgage backed securities to put on their on their excuse me, on their own portfolios allows them to basically like allows the Federal Reserve to unload their mortgage backed securities at the same time. Oh, man, this lady just pulled out a hatchet. Man, I don't want to film that. Yeah. Anyhow, um, so what a weird live stream to be doing right here. Anyhow, so as the demand for these mortgage-backed securities is out there in the free market, the Federal Reserve could very well, could very well unload their balance sheet into this free market um, demand coming from these things. So even if the Fed funds level does rise up, if the demand is high enough for these mortgage-backed securities, they could. Jesus, she's gonna hit this dude with that thing. All right, I got to show you guys this. I'm not messing around. Check it out. She is mad. Ugh. Horrible. Where are the police when you need them, right? Okay. Um. Anyway. Sorry, guys. Where'd you go? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, homeboy looks like he's about ready to leave, I guess. I don't think she's actually going to hurt him. It is Oregon, right? Golly. No, she's she's packing her stuff. She's leaving. All right. Uh, let me get into what you guys are talking about. Man, I should have found another place to park. All right. Hang out at Seaside Safeway. Yeah, you'd see that all the time. Maybe they're fighting over lumber. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the case. Call the police. No, the police are here all the time. She's just, I think they're just the mental issues are just kind of going up. Where's your gun? I don't need a gun myself. These guys don't really pick on me too much. Every once in a while, I'll have somebody come over and give me a hard time, like, you know, as I do the recording. But let's talk about mortgages. What do you guys think about that idea, though? Is the Federal Reserve really able to lift the interest rates into the demand for mortgages out there, or at least the demand for people who would be buying these mortgage-backed securities? That would be the real question. The West Coast is a disaster. You guys just want to talk about the uh, the mental issues coming from these homeless people. Let's see here. 
Okay, you could clip that and get more views. Yeah, I really could. I don't want to. Yeah. All right, 210 spread, inverting bad. Yeah, now that is something to watch for. And, you know, but that's actually a pretty good thing to keep an eye on is these is the treasuries, especially the 10-year. Like, the 10-year is the indicator of where all interest rates go. Oh, good, my buddy Steve just pulled up. Maybe he'll keep them from fighting. Um, so... <laughs> So if you watch the 10 year and you kind of follow like what interest rates go as far as the 10 year goes, like if the 10 year starts to rise, you're going to find like everything starts to rise as far as mortgages go. But the 10 year is actually holding down on the yield much better than just about anything else out there. All the rest of the yields across the yield curve are rising. And now when you think about this demand coming from, you know, the, the free market out there. Oh, see, there's the police right now. Yeah, I didn't have to call anybody. The police are already coming. <laughs> and they're not going... Uh, yeah, here they come. Okay. So, anyway, as the um, as the demand for these investments, these ass assets, like these dead assets, the 10-year treasury, the 2-year, as the nervousness of the investors are out there, you're going to find that, like, the short term is going to rise on the yield, where things on the longer term might hold a little, for, a little more steady especially when it comes to like say the 10 year people are not as fearful of 10 years out as they are about the current future of things so the current like situation two years much higher yield on that as the people are going to demand higher return for because they're fearful of inflation or the short-term you know issues going on in the economy especially with the idea of a recession but then take a look at the 20 year like the 20 year is higher than all the rest of them and it's not so much like there is this fear of the 20, like being 20 years out. It's the reason that you think, or at least that I would think that they're higher, is that the 20 year doesn't have as much like market participation going on with it. Um, in fact, I think it was just recently that they started issuing out the 20 year bond. So when you imagine like the whole pool of buyers out there who are buying into like US treasuries, when it comes to like the 30 year, the 10 year, the five year, the one year, these all have like major demand coming from, from the market as they, you know, as they've been participating in it for quite some time. But when this 20 year starts to come in or it's new to the market, there's not as many buyers and sellers of the 20 year out there. So you would see like the, the yield on that one go up as the prices of it goes down, as there's just not as much liquidity within that particular slot you know of of mortgages or not mortgages but um, of treasuries of the bonds yep he ran them off so incidents all taken care of now right so uh, let me show you guys just because i know you're curious so no problems everybody's safe now okay now when it comes to the indicators coming from the u.s treasuries like a lot of people follow that that two year, 10 year, and when that inverts, when the 10 years now has a yield that's less than what the two year is, that's always been an indicator of a recession. And that is a very good indicator. It was Alan Greenspan, who I was listening to years ago when they, it was funny because in this interview with Alan Greenspan, they asked him, it was just like, so there's no uh, interest rates rising in the foreseeable future. And he was just like, wait a minute, what? He asked the uh, the lady who was giving the interview, he was like, what was that? She says, yeah, since there's no like idea of like interest rates or in anything coming up in the future as far as the lifting of interest rates. Everybody was always like, at this time, everybody was just presuming that we were going to go into negative interest rates and it was like negative or downward interest rate trajectory from now on. And, you know, so they, they asked him that. It was just like, since interest rates won't be rising into the future, and he was just like, yeah, I wouldn't be holding my breath on that. And then they talked about the two-year tenure. Now, you got to think, this was just before, you know, it was probably like in 2018, just before like all the signs of a recession were coming throughout 2019. I mean, we were reporting on and a lot of other people were predicting the recession in 2020. And then the pandemic kicked in and everything got blamed on that. So there was definitely a slowdown, an economic slowdown happening prior to the pandemic. I mean, all throughout 2019, there was plenty of plenty of people talking about a, a few up and coming recession. But back to this Alan Greenspan interview, he said what he finds to be a much better indicator is when you see the spread between the five year and the 30 year grow. 
So when you see this start to increase, this spread between the five-year and 30-year, he says that's corporate management's willingness to invest. And I think that's probably a good indicator that you're probably out of the recession or that the idea of there continuing to be a recession going into the future would probably be diminished at that point since the corporate management would be willing to invest during that time. So right now I'm watching the 30 year, five year do their thing and that inverted long before the yield curve did. I mean, I would put out a video talking about that. It was just like, well, the 30 year and the five year just inverted. Nobody talks about this. They're gonna wait for the two year to 10 year to be the in in recession indicator. But we called it out on this channel long before anybody else did. And in fact, it was like right after I put the video out that you started seeing news articles talking about the 30 year and five year inverting. All right. I got about another 15 minutes out here, guys. Let's see. What do you get? Okay. When everyone talks about a recession, it is inevitable. That I so I so agree with that. I think there will be another negative GDP quarter. So technically we are in a recession and we have inflation as well. Um, tough spot for the Fed. Yeah, I think the tougher spot is trying to rely on the supply chain to bring down inflation. And when you lift interest rates and you make it difficult to borrow money or start businesses or even just conduct business in general, because most businesses are operating off of like debt, you know, they have to have a continuous debt market happening. And if the interest rates rise, then it makes that business even more difficult to run. Now, I'm not trying to say that the Federal Reserve is trying to hold back on the distribution networks, trying to get the, you know, because basically that's the what they're looking for is the supply side to start becoming more efficient, bringing more products to the table. And when you have more products to the table and less people buying them, then you have the inflation coming down. That's what they're looking for. So one, they're looking for something for the supply side of things, and then they're also looking for unemployment to rise. Those are the two ways that they're actually gonna deal with inflation. Trying to bring down consumer demand, that's that's not gonna happen. Like, I mean, it is gonna slow down, but it wasn't the overwhelming consumer demand that caused the inflation. It was the supply chain breakdown and then a shot in the arm with some stimulus. But other than that, there was no reason why we should have seen the inflation that we had if it wasn't for the fact that we had a severe supply chain breakdown. That's what really did it. Um, you know, I mean, we can, you know, a lot of people will debate that and it'll probably go down in history is probably one of the biggest debates in his, you know, as far as what caused the inflation that we are seeing. But I just looked at lumber and said, you know, I mean, there is no inflation in lumber and everybody called me crazy on that, said I was delusional and didn't know what I was talking about. When lumber was at seventeen hundred per thousand, I said, "No, this isn't money printing that's causing this." And you know, now here we are at five fifty, two thousand eighteen levels, and the Federal Reserve has hardly unwound their balance sheet. They have barely gone into any kind of quantitative tightening. It's more of the perception out there that people are having, and that's really the case. You know? Thank you very much. Mm, what is it, Music Fanatic ninety three? Thank you so much for the four ninety nine. I would subscribe to your Patreon and pay $10 a month if you put more conspiratorial ideas and content on there. Um, I, I, look, I mean, I appreciate that. Um, and I mean, I would love to do like some exclusive stuff for Patreon. I'm just having a hard enough time even can, doing some of the things that I'm doing and trying to commit to making like newsletters and stuff like that. I mean, I, I would love to do something like that, but I really need to find the time and not just the ambition, but the time to get it done in a consistent manner. Um, like I said, I'm already feeling like I'm short of time as it is. And so I can't imagine throwing some more, some more stuff on top of that. But I mean, I, I have considered it. Um, you know, it's certainly another way to generate some, some more revenue for the channel and to put out some newsletters like that. So I'm not saying that I'm not going to do it. It's just that that's what's kind of holding me back. It's just literally just trying to find the time. All right. Uh, you're one of the people I watch to get information on lumber. You're literally in the field. Yeah, I know, right? See, that's where it's easy to, to get mistaken. I mean, there are so many, like even people that I know who work the mill didn't understand some of the things that I was talking about. I was like... You know, a lot of people, it's it's easy for people to gather like what happened during the pandemic because you, I mean, it's it's just, 
it was just so intuitive to, to just think it, right? There was a lockdown. People didn't go to the mill. If you're not going to the mill to work, then you're not producing. And if you're not producing, then there's no inventory levels being risen or coming into availability. At the same time, everybody gets the stimulus check and zaps out the inventory. So like starting from the pandemic, it makes a lot of sense. Like you can just, you know, you can just kind of put the pieces together and say, yeah, that's what happened to lumber. But if you go back and you look at my channel, all throughout 2019, going into 2020, before the pandemic, we were talking about mill curtailments and shutdowns and like chaos taking place up there in the British Columbia area, who is a major supplier of softwoods, basically the framing material coming into the United States. I think like we import 20% of the softwoods that we consume here in the United States comes from Canada. And of that 20%, it's like, I forget how much comes from the British Columbia area, but it's a significant amount. So the things that happen in the British Columbia area have a have a major impact on the on the lumber industry going throughout all of the United States. And you know there was an issue up there. Like if you look now, like the British Columbia area, that's that's hammered. Like there's still like an intense amount of trees. There's they're they pump out a lot of material out of the British Columbia area. Even today, even with all the curtailments and shutdowns and everything that happened there's still like british columbia is a major producer of lumber and right now there's i think there's 310 fires up there in in that particular area so you know that there's going into curtailments real soon where they just won't be able to produce lumber like they'll just like literally they can't go up into the woods to cut anything because it's all on fire once that ends they will go into salvage mode and they will start harvesting as many of the trees that got burnt up because they're still like they're decent on the inside they're just the outside got charred up but you can still log these things and and cut them up for for lumber so when these fires die down when we get into the end of the summertime you're going to find that the fires will be out and the in the british columbia area will go into massive production trying to deal with the with the the salvaging of these of these burnt up trees i just saw another super chat there what did that say this is from b dan 82 five dollars thank you very much for the super chat i really appreciate it i'm going to be out here for another eight minutes or so guys hey ue what's the pros and cons of protectionist policies is it net positive or negative for the economy uh for the u.s economy what it is to be honest, if you go into this protection, okay, so let's let's just use like those those semiconductors because that's a big one right now. Everybody like kind of wanted to get mad at me because it is for national security reasons that they say. Basically, I came up with the argument that bringing in production into the United States is by far the most expensive place to produce just about anything. And there's places all around the world in which that you could produce items much cheaper and efficiently, more efficiently than you can in the United States. But now when you got this idea of like semiconductors or something, now they have like this national security thing going on, right? Where they don't want like, you know, China producing these things and then our military using those particular those particular computer components because of like, you know, they don't want like national security reasons, you know, being like relied upon from a from a foreign producer like China. So all that stuff really does make a lot of sense. Here's the problem with it is, is that unless it's just the military that is able to buy and and be be the the main supply buyer of this supply of semiconductors, unless they can be profitable doing that, just selling it straight to the military and the military consuming enough of it, then most likely they're going to have to start sell those they're going to have to sell those chips to somebody else as well in order to be profitable, right? Now you can have the military buy, you can have taxpayer military funded purchases of tax like subsidized you know computer chips, right? So you got like military tax, you know, buying tax subsidies chips. And then you can get this national security thing like, okay, cool. Now we got this national security and we got these chips that are made here in the United States going to our military. But if those guys can't sell those chips off to another vent, you know, somebody else who's producing something out there that's not military equipment, but just like a regular private buyer of them. If they go to that private buyer and it's like, hey, man, we got the best computer chips. We got the best semiconductors in the world. And they say, yeah, those are pretty nice. But you know what? those guys build them a hell of a lot cheaper and we're going to go buy them from them because you guys, although they are high quality, you're also the most expensive and everything is about input cost. So even if you do have this national security reasons and for protection reasons, 
it's going to cost, not only is it going to cost the military more because they need them for national security reasons, so they have to buy these expensive ones. But then on top of it, that particular company that is producing them won't really be able to be competitive against the global markets out there. So now you either have to put the tariffs on everybody out there, making it more expensive for them to produce anything here in the United States. Why would you do it? Why would you be like the private body? Like you're looking at it, it's like, man, I was producing here in the United States. I was able to get these, you know, semiconductor chips and all the other components fairly expensive or fairly cheaper from from a foreign producer, but now they're putting these tariffs on there and I can't buy from them. I'm being forced to buy from the high quality, you know, domestic manufacturer, but I'm really not profitable in my product that I build anymore. So I'm just going to move this whole operation overseas and just get out of here altogether because otherwise I'm just not going to be profitable in my production here. So you see what's happened there? Like it's a great idea for national security reasons. Yeah, I get that. No problem. But trying to maintain that, it's going to be like constant taxpayer subsidies or tariffs, which is going to make it very difficult on the rest of the producers producers here in the United States who are buying those components from overseas. If they get hit with tariffs, they're just like, man, why are, you, why are we even producing here? See, like the same thing happened, like think about it, like what's happening with Canadian lumber. Let's this okay, let's forget about semiconductors and just think about the Canadian lumber. They constantly get accused. The Canadians get accused of like dumping cheap lumber into the United States and being and they're subsidizing their mills up there. Right? So the United States hits them with these tariffs. And not only the Trump administration, but the Biden administration did it too, right? And then they so they put these tariffs on this lumber to try and, you know, keep them from having this unfair advantage. Or there's an unfair advantage that, you know, hurts our mills here, our domestic suppliers. So what does that do? It drives the price of lumber up. Well, now our domestic suppliers are happy with that, right? And it kind of pisses the Canadians off in a sense. So what do these guys do? Well, all these Canadian mills like Canfor, Interfor, um, West Fraser, I mean, all these guys, they're, they're bailing, like, well, they're not necessarily bailing out of Canada, but they're setting up shop down in the southern part of the United States. I mean, they're buying up mills, buying up land, buying up, putting, building mills. They're doing all kinds of stuff down in the southern part of the United States. So if you have issues where you're getting hit with tariffs because you're importing lumber into, into the country, why? why? Why deal with that when you can just set up shop right in the country and then not deal with the, with the tariffs that are coming from it? It's still a Canadian-owned company and the profits are and eventually going to leave the United States. But then they get to avoid the tariffs. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So let's see here. We need subsidies for industries. I say we subsidize cannabis. Yeah. I don't know why you would need to subsidize cannabis. Just go to Oregon. It practically spills out on the ground. Like, weed has no value up here any longer. I mean, the only way you can really make money off of weed is you either have to grow the finest weed so you can get the highest price for it or you have to have a process from it like you know you're making like hash out of it or edibles or doing something with it but the actual growing of marijuana and selling just the just a generic marijuana out there like just selling weed it it there's there's no value to it anymore i mean farmers are basically suffering you know i mean some farmers out there are doing it and making it but a lot of people who had these projections on how much they were able to make off of their weed just really got hit hard. I always relate it back to the uh, blueberry farmer that had, you know, had a seasonal operation. He thought, man, I could have my employees here all the time if I had this continuous garden going of like, you know, producing marijuana. Well, you know, the first year he did it, it did great. He made all this money off of it, but then everybody else started farming the stuff too. And his product pretty much, well, it just pretty much became worthless to him. He had all this investment into operation and then realized that he couldn't really make any money off of it and almost put his put his farm under. So I don't know if he's still in, in business right now. All right. UE knows a little too much about the weed business. Well, you got to understand, I mean, it's the Pacific Northwest and then it's Oregon, right? Like everybody up here smokes weed. There's very, very few people who don't. And weed was never really a crime. As long as you had less than an ounce, it was a misdemeanor. So even if you got busted with weed, you paid a ticket and you went on your way. Like that was it. There was no, 
there was no real punishment to it. It was more of an annoyance, right? So unless you were like selling it or growing it, but this, the simple possession of weed has never been a crime. It's, it's always been a misdemeanor in Oregon. So like the, the risk to, to it was very minimal. Like, you know, everybody smokes weed. It's just like, it's, it's just common. Yeah. Uh, see my friend called Mike. All right. The ones able to make money are the emerging markets, meaning state legalization and setting up shop. Wow, you guys want to talk about weed. Yeah, that's really the truth behind it. Um, is that when you initially get in, like when they first legalize it, then there's a nice booming business that happens right there. But as soon as it gets flooded, it's over. It's just, you know, it's just a plant. There's nothing special about it. It doesn't do anything for you. It has one serious purpose to it. And then after that, it's, it doesn't, it's like, it doesn't take any special talent, right? I mean, you know, you throw a seed in the ground and it can grow into weed. I mean, I've seen people who really understand the process of growing weed. Like they understand what it takes to grow really good stuff. But then I've seen people throw a few seeds behind the shed of their, you know, behind the garage or something, forget about it, and it ends up being killer. So like, it doesn't take any special talent to grow weed. It takes special talent to grow really good weed if you need to know what you're doing and grow abundance of it. But there's nothing special about it, you know? I mean, at least like if it's a craft beer, right? Like you can, you can explain to somebody how to make beer, right? And you can give them step-by-step -step instructions, like right down to a T, like everything, like perfectly, you can give them instru instructions on how to brew beer. And when it, when you give that instruction to somebody and they follow it to a T, they're going to brew some beer and it might taste okay, but I guarantee you it will not taste like the beer that the brewer can, can produce. Even if he gives like detailed instructions on it, there will, there's no way that it will taste the same. Every brewer is going to be different when it comes to the manufacturing of beer, right? Because you have to really know what you're doing. You have to understand what it is that's going into the process of making this beer. But growing weed doesn't really take any special talents or skills. Yeah. Um, let's see. Real estate done, yeah. Okay, let's see. How much time do I have? I got about three minutes, guys, and I'm gonna bail out of here. Um, it is special, it's not. Okay, you need you need to separate the good from the bad. That's the process that needs to be taught. Uh, oh, well, now I need to drink beer and smoke weed today. Well, it is Saturday, so I'll go for it, I guess. I seen a person in our town that brews beer, but it's so expensive, he's not making money. Yeah, um, we have a lot of brewers here in, in Astoria. I mean... You know, got the Fort George and Bowie and Wet Dog and just like there was all kinds of brewers around here. And some of them are really good. Like, you know, they're you know, world class style beers and a lot of people do it for a hobby. So it's like it's like beer and weed are very common up here. You know? Don't we want to talk about MBS and mortgage backed securities? Does it make sense that you can process? <laughs> I should have titled this something to do with weed. Uh, okay, does it make sense that you can process weed but can't grow it only if certain people in your government are making profit? Maybe. I don't know. You can grow it legally in Oregon, you know, um, and then if you have a medical license, you know, or a medical permit, then you can grow even more of it. But you can grow legally here in, 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 the, in, uh, in Oregon. Um, hopefully we get 100 basis points next week. Yeah, and I'm still like, I mean, what is that going to do? Is that that's another question to kind of ask? You know, if the Federal Reserve does lift the interest rates one percent, is that going to cause mortgage rates to increase? I mean, pretty much the mortgages, the mortgage rates that we are seeing right now have already priced in the the Fed hike. I mean, whether it's a three quarters of a percentage point or a whole percentage point, there's not going to be a shock to the market because they're already pricing that stuff in and they have been for the last three months. I mean, just take a look at the, the current mortgage rates for the last three months and you're going to see like they spiked up at one point. They were like as high as 7% and as low as like, you know, just under 6%, but they've been bouncing around between six and 7% for like three months now. And the fed has lifted interest rates. 
they put out enough jawboning out there. People are very much concerned about it. There is all kinds of talk happening out there about, you know, crashing housing market and, you know, how the mortgage demand has dropped to a 22 year low. I think I have that article down in the description there, but it's not doing to the mortgage backed securities what a lot of people would have anticipated and sending them to like 10, 15%. All this news going out there still doesn't drive the mortgage rates up any higher than the 7% because I believe that once you get up to that level, the buyers of mortgage-backed securities, the pension funds, the you know the insurance companies, they love it. They're like, man, I, that's, my, that's my price right there. And they start buying into it. So now you have a buyer of mortgage-backed securities at that level. It doesn't need to be the Federal Reserve. It can be the free market doing it. And since you don't have like a flood of mortgage-backed securities coming in due to refinancing. It's just the people who are really, like a few people who are refinancing, but for the most part, it's just the the people who are buying homes right now. And since you have like home purchases or at least the mortgages being taken out at a 22-year low, well, then that's not as many mortgage-backed securities coming to the market for people to buy. So like supply and demand, you know, there's less supply of mortgage-backed securities going on out there. At the same time, the Federal Reserve is trying to unload those things. So that usually, that to me is just like, okay, so the supply of mortgage-backed securities for people to purchase is not as prevalent as it was two years ago. It's actually diminishing. And if you have a diminishing supply and the demand is up, what happens to the price? Well, you start getting an increase in the price or a supporting of the of the price. So that's probably one of the reasons why we're not seeing mortgage-backed securities any higher than they are right now is because the free market is just like, no, man, we're happy at where it's at right now. Now, I'm not saying that couldn't change. I mean, that very well could change if like, especially if like foreclosures, defaults start kicking into gear. If we start having a lot of foreclosures within the, the mortgage industry, then those mortgage-backed securities could start turning into something of a toxic asset. And at that point, then yeah, you would see the prices of those things fall and the yields begin to rise. But as of right now, I, I don't see that happening, right? And so we have to kind of consider that, you know, is there a demand or enough of a demand right now coming from the free market to support the mortgage-backed securities at the level that they are? I mean, it's a very, I mean, it's a logical question to think about, you know? Anyway. I have to go back to work. You guys have been awesome. Thank you very much for the super chats. There was 350 of you and 95 hit the like button. I certainly do appreciate that. Continue on with the conversation when I get this video uploaded. I would love to see what you guys have to say about it. Uh, uneducated economist, you guys let me know.